This assembly was motivated by the gap students at the high school have felt between their, between their experiences and their representatives. So you can hear this kind of distance in the way that we talk about government. We talk about it as removed and impenetrable to us since we can't vote. And you can see this distance when millennials barely end up showing up to the polling place and elect people who look and are way, way older than, than them in the first place. And you can even taste this distance when you see representatives like Paul Ryan, Chuck Schumer, Trump, whoever you want, not vaguely representing the interests of the community we know, whichever side you are and whoever, whoever you support. So the Democrats Club had an idea to bring in Congressman Jim McGovern. Then it turns out, Environmental Club had that same idea too. Then GSA, Feminist Collective, and the Mayor's Youth Commission. And of course, Mr. Lombardi supported it. And today with our representative in Congress, standing right here, listening to our questions and our concerns, we're hoping to narrow this huge distance to like 10 feet and shape the future that all of us are going to have to live in. So I am very, very happy to present Jim McGovern, who grew up in Worcester, and has served this district on the Progressive Caucus, fighting for cheaper college, fighting for international nutrition rights, and getting money out of politics for the past 22 years. Welcome and thank you, Jim McGovern. Well, as the moderators are coming up, let me, let me thank Ben for the introduction and thank the students here for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. I want, I, well, I love you too. And I want to say, I want to thank uh, Mr. Lombardi. Um, you know, uh, Elena, who's here, um, was one of my interns. Um, she, I was really happy to see her. And, but to all of you, uh, this is going to be great. And, and this is, you know, and I appreciate uh, the nice words that Ben just said, but this is a learning experience for me as well. And so I'm interested to hear what's on your mind, and I'm going to try to answer your questions the best I can. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to probably say I don't know the answer. Um, and, uh, but I'm looking forward to this. So I think we're, what are we waiting? We're ready for the moderators right now? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Is this on? Hello? Hi. Okay. So this is really tall. Um, so we formatted this town hall to work. We had five groups, as were named, that worked on it. So we're going to ask our questions first, and then we have submitted questions from all of you. And there are also people running down the sides of the aisles with note cards and pencils. If you haven't, up back there is one. If you haven't gotten a chance to ask a question yet, now's your opportunity. Put your name on one side, your question on the other, and we'll try and get to it. Um, but for now, the question from Environmental Club. Hi, I'm. Oh, this, okay. Hi, I'm Aislinn Jewett, and my question is: What do you believe to be the most pressing climate change-related issue right now, and what are your suggestions for actions everyday citizens can take, especially during a time where conservatives hold the most power in the federal government? Well, I think one of the biggest worries I have is that we have so many members of Congress who don't believe in climate change. Um, I, I, it's, I, they must have failed science when they were in school, because every scientist in the world. <laughs> tells us that climate change is real and serious. Um, and, and so we need to get back in the Paris Accords, um, and we need to take a leadership role in, in, in the world. Um, and yes, we have Trump, and we have a very right-wing uh, Congress that uh, you know, needs to go back to school. Um, but, uh, but I think states need to pick up the slack in the meantime. And so you know, I join with a lot of you in opposing the pipeline that was being uh, talked about out in this area because I, I don't think our future relies on fossil fuels. I think we ought to be investing in clean, green, renewable energy. That means more sol solar panels, more wind, uh, exploring things like tidal energy. I mean, there's all the all these new ideas out there that uh, can provide uh, can meet our energy needs, but that don't pollute the the, uh, the earth. Uh, and um, and so uh, I, I think the most challenging thing right now is to get the United States re-engaged um, in dealing with the issue of climate change. You know, I, I'm on the Agriculture Committee, and um, I do farm tours every year, and, you know, the last couple of times, the last couple of years, you know, almost every place I went, farmers would talk to me about climate change.
because they're seeing these crazy weather patterns, these extremes that they've never seen before. I mean, there's one guy who was in his mid-80s telling me that you know, the last couple of years have been like, unlike anything he's ever seen. Uh, we had late freezes, um, you know, uh, these droughts that dried up wells. And he says, something's going on with this planet and you guys need to focus on it. And he's right. I mean, climate change is not just this abstract issue that, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, over, you know, brie and wine, right? It is, it, it, it has real consequences right here at home. It affects our farmers. Uh, it reflects, it, it, it impacts our, uh, our health and our well-being. Um, and so this is, this is serious. Uh, and um, so, uh, so we need to, I think what people need to do uh, is they need to demand that their elected officials not only understand that this is a real issue, but become more engaged. We all can do more. Uh, and that means I need to fight harder in Washington to uh, confront the non-believers uh, and to do damage control so that we don't turn the clock back too much uh, with this administration. Uh, but this is, this is a big deal. You know, a few years ago I was in Africa and I was looking at some of our international food programs and I was, uh, you know, driving, the guy who was driving me said to me, oh, look over, he over there, that's Mount Kilimanjaro. And I'm like, oh yeah, I remember, I read the book, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. I'm like, but where are the snows? There was like a little dinky white cap on this mountain that I used to think had a huge big you know, white cap of snow on it. And he said that the, 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 it's, the white cap is disappearing and it's disappearing rapidly. He said, like in a matter of a couple of years, I, he, this guy was telling me he noticed um, the change. And he said, but this is happening all throughout the continent. And what that means is that less water is going into the valley. That means the soils that people rely on to farm, you know, aren't as uh, rich as they should be. That means people are fighting over water. That means there are all kinds of tensions in the community. So this is a, this is a big deal. And, um, and we need you to step up and, um, you, know, you know, certainly work on me, your congressman and your senators, but you have relatives in other states too. You have cousins in other states and you have friends in other states. Call them and ask them to email their member of Congress as well. Thank you. So the next club is the Feminist Collective. Okay. Hi, Hi. I'm Zalia Maya, Hi, and Zalia. I'm from the Feminist Collective. Good. And our question is, how do you support women and other minority groups and make sure they feel com comfortable partaking in politics? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, and, uh, and we, all, we, we, need, we need to figure out, all of us, how to, how to do it better. I mean, I, one of the problems with our politics is it has become kind of exclusive rather than inclusive. Um, and that's not the way the system is supposed to be. Um, so we need to support women candidates, uh, candidates um, from communities of color. We need to support uh, diversity in the workplace. We need to listen to you know, the various organizations who represent the groups that you've just mentioned um, and, and make them be part of the conversation. Um, you know, I mean, we, I think all of us, and I try to do it, and if people have ideas on how we could do it better, I'm, I'm all ears, but, you know, I, I, I always tell people politics is about inclusion, um, and good politics is also about addition. Every, everybody who's in elected office ought to want to be inclusive w within the community because that's, you want to win votes, right? But it's also the right thing to do. And by the way, I don't know everything. You know, I mean, I grew up, you know, uh, in Worcester and, you know, in a middle class family and, you know, I viewed life one way, but, you know, everybody has their own unique experiences and their own perspectives. Some people have felt discrimination in our community. Some people have been harassed. Some people have felt isolated. Some people have felt neglected. It is important that there be this kind of discussion in this direct line so that we can figure out ways to make sure that we can deal with some of these things. You know, right now we're dealing with a big issue nationwide. I mean, um, you know, this whole Me Too movement that is going on that you've all been hearing about. But you know, what is really kind of stunning to me is that harassment and degradation of women just didn't happen in the last few years. It isn't a new phenomenon. It has been going on forever. 
Um, and, you know, we're at this unique moment now where, you know, we, where there seems to be a growing awareness and a growing outrage, which is good. Um, but now the question is, what are we doing about it? I mean, is it going to be anything more than just, oh, I'm going to wear a button or I'm going to be be outraged, you know, by issuing a statement, or are we going to change our laws? Um, are we going to get tougher in terms of oversight in our workplace, how people are treated? Um, you know, we, we got to deal with issues like pay equity, where, you know, uh, we still live in a country where women still get paid on average less than men do for the same work. I mean, you know, there are a whole bunch of these issues that we need to address, but I think I think we need to find ways to empower these voices. Thank you. And now we have a question from the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Hi, I'm Jesse, uh, and my question is, how do we study, treat, and improve medicine and human health without politicizing it? Uh, well, that's a really good question, and I wish I had a really good answer for it, because I don't understand why it is politicized. I just don't get it. I mean, um, you know, I, I mean, we, uh, even things as basic as funding the National Institutes of Health, you know, and basic medical research become politicized because somebody doesn't like the results or, their, or, their, or the scientific results don't fit into their preconceived notion about a particular subject controversy over stem cell research. Um, everything becomes, you know, politicized that way. Um, look, the deal is, you know, just like, you know, when it comes to climate change, the same thing with, with healthcare. I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, so I listen to scientists. I want to learn from scientists. I'm not a medical doctor or medical researcher, so I want to listen to them. And I'm going to trust them to give me the best advice. Um, I'm going to I, I want to, I want to uh, CDC that um, you know will help protect our community, um, and you know, and not be subject to uh, uh, attacks because the CDC says, for example, that gun violence is also a health epi epidemic in, the, in this country. It's just a reality. That's this. That's the. Those are the facts, right? So we can argue how how, how best to solve some of these things, but we shouldn't have an argument over the facts. Science shouldn't be politicized. You know, certainly medicine and how and healthcare shouldn't be politicized. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I mean, maybe there's a follow-up here that I'm, if you have anything that I didn't address. Uh, we're just interested in sort of what we can do to sort of help push our representatives to like take a stand, especially on issues like abortion, where it can get very like political, like what should we be doing? Okay. I was just at Belchertown High School uh, and a student asked me, because I co-chair the Human Rights Commission in Congress and we deal with human rights, international human rights issues, we def uh, you know, we, uh, all over the world. And it, it, I got up and he says, well, you know, you voted um, against banning late-term abortions, um, so how can you say you're for human rights? And I said, look, I know people have their strong opinions on that issue, but here's the deal. Um, you know, my vote was based on listening to people in my community. I had a woman who came to me who said that she used to be the mem a member of the Right to Life community uh, at her church. She, she w wanted a family. She got pregnant. And uh, as, the pre as the pregnancy developed, the baby uh, was developing without a brain, technically alive, but would probably die instantly upon birth. She was prepared to carry the pregnancy to the full term, but um, then another complication developed. Uh, and that is that I was told by my doctor if I carried this to the full term, my health could be compromised, I could lose my life. And, I, and, and chances are that I would never be able to have any more children. So she says, I had this procedure, which this young man um, that asked me the question, defined as a late-term abortion. I said, but here's the thing. She is now, uh, uh, she got pregnant again. She has three wonderful kids. Her life is great. But if that was illegal, you know, and she was forced to carry that pregnancy, she could have lost her life or she, she would not have had another kid. Life doesn't fit into these nice, neat categories where everything's all this or all that. Life is gray. 
right? It's complicated. Um, and I think when it comes to abortion, I am strongly pro-choice. I believe that women ought to ha decide what is best for them and their health and their future, not a group of predominantly male politicians in Washington. I just think that that is a mistake, you know? And so we talk about, res you know, and the deal is that the, the, the debate on abortion is that people have strong views that they could never have an abortion. That's your right, right? But passing a law that says if you ever had an abortion, you would be guilty of a federal crime, you could be put in jail and your doctor could be put in jail, I don't think that that's right. Uh, so, um, so I think you know, those who feel strongly, like I do, that women should have that right to choose, understand this, those rights are under attack right now in Washington. Um, and you know, just because you know, we move past a hurdle and we have certain rights doesn't mean they can't be taken away. Um, and we have, we, we've already had two or three votes in the House of Representatives in the last few months uh, attacking a woman's right to choose and her reproductive rights and reproductive freedoms. So these rights are under attack and people need to make sure their voices are heard. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Okay, and the next question is from the Mayor's Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Marga Shaka Green. I'm the chair of the Mayor's Youth Commission. Mm -hmm. um, the question we would like to ask you is, would you be in support of lowering the municipal voting age to 16 in order to involve and represent young adults in politics and government? I would, yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and I will tell you this, and I'm not just telling you this because I'm speaking before a young audience here, uh, but, um, you know, I have had more intelligent and thoughtful conversations with you already and with a lot of other people your age all across the state than I've had with uh, many of my colleagues in Congress. Uh, so I think uh, you have, I mean, you know, the, the, the issues that you're bringing up to me here today, uh, you know, it's clear that you have researched them, that you have thought about them, that you are well informed. And I think we ought to welcome that kind of input, um, you know, into our electoral system. And so, yeah, I would be, yes. Thank you. All right, so this is our final club question. So I'm quickly going to explain how your questions will work. I'm going to call down three names, and you can just line up at any mic. Uh, so I'm going to call the first three people now, and if you want to work on getting your way up to either that aisle or this mic here. Um, the first one is from Willa Sippel. Maya Mintzkoculo, I'm sorry. and Ezra David. And then the last club question is coming from the Young Democrats. Hi, I'm um, Tadea. Uh, so I was just wondering, um, our criminal justice system has an unfortunate culture of favoring punishment instead of rehabilitation. When I, as someone about to turn 16, looks at the states that prosecute 16 year olds as adults, I just see a reinforcement of that message. Um, so I was wondering if you believe that a federal law mandating that children be tried in juvenile court would be beneficial in helping in changing this culture. Yeah, I do, and I, and I believe it. I mean, I think that's the, uh, that, that, that is what we should, how we should be looking at it. Uh, look, um, you know, um, one of the things that kind of bothers me about our culture is that, um, look, when people make mistakes and they get punished, um, you, know, um, you know, they deserve a second chance. And we say all the time, we believe in second chances. But um, I can tell you that um, people who have been incarcerated at some point in their life, who we deal with on a regular basis, you know, are not often given second chances. It's hard to find a job. Nobody wants to hire them. No one wants to take a chance. No one wants to believe that you could change. Um, and yet, people can change and people do change. And certainly we don't want to you know, when it comes to a juvenile, right? I mean, we, we don't want to say that something you did that was wrong, you know, when you were 15 should mean that your entire life is, is ruined. Um, 
you know, we ought to be looking at incarceration not just as punishment, but as rehabilitation. Um, and, and we are, because it, to the extent that we don't, the chances of recidiv recidivism are, are, are very, very high. I mean, if people make mistakes and go to prison, I would like it so they don't ever go back to prison. Um, and so, um, so we need to think, uh, it's not just what happens in prison, it's also what we do when people are released from prison. Uh, and I think we, we, we need a greater discussion on this because um, it is a problem. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Willa Sippel. And um, my question is, what will you do, you kind of already answered this primarily, but what will you do to protect reproductive rights for women uh, in the future as those rights become more under attack? Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, we're gonna fight like hell against those who wanna take those rights away. I mean, I mean, and I, I have to, as I said before, I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, you know, whether it's protecting women's reproductive rights, whether it is climate change, you know, I mean, I go right down the list. I mean, there are some things where we think we've made progress that, quite frankly, you know, uh, we're in danger of, of seeing us move the clock backwards. And again, I, I you know, I, um, you know, we, we, um, we vote on, in the House anyway, um, in a given year, there's at least three or four or five votes, abortion-related votes, that come up. Um, and every time they bring it up, they try to word it in a way that makes it more and more difficult for people to vote no because it, be, it becomes more complicated to explain at home. But it, every one of the bills they bring up has the same intent, to move us closer and closer to a point, to a time when abortion will become a federal crime and, when women, uh, and, and where women who have abortions you know, will be arrested and where doctors will be arrested. I don't want us to be a country like that. Um, and I want abortion to be safe, I want abortion to be legal, I want abortion to be rare. Um, and, um, and the best way to do that uh, is not by turning it into a federal crime and finding ways, you know, again, to provide support uh, to women and making sure they have their health, the health care uh, that is so important to them. So I, um, and by the way, you know, there's been an attack on Planned Parenthood so you, from the president and others. I just want to point out something just if anyone ever brings this up to you. Planned Parenthood, by the way, is a lot more than, you know, uh, reproductive rights uh, issues. And it's a lot more than abortion. Planned Parenthood, you know, is basically, for many people, is where they get their health care. And by the way, not just women, but a lot of men get their health care from Planned Parenthood. And they do cancer screenings, they do, you know, all kinds of tests. Uh, that a lot of community health centers do, and a lot of our local hospitals do. So, um, you know, there's this attempt in Washington to simplify everything and turn everything into a soundbite, but when they do that, sometimes you don't realize that these organizations that are under attack, you know, are so vital to our community, and Planned Parenthood is one of them. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Ezra David. Um, would you support opening places in Massachusetts where people can legally use uh, opioids in order to possibly reduce the danger of opioid overdoses? Um, I, I guess what, I, what I'm in favor of is helping people get the health care support that they need to deal with, you know, addictions and, you know, whatever challenges they're having. Um, and, and so I would rely on you know, what the healthcare uh, profession tells me uh, what to do. This is a really complicated issue on a whole range of levels. You know, the president mentioned it in his State of the Union address. Um, and the problem with what he did is he mentioned it, but, you know, um, he, there was no promise of any resources to help combat the crisis that has engulfed this entire country. But uh, we need to look at this in a number of ways. One is we need to find out how we can prevent people from going down a road that quite frankly is life-threatening. And I believe that, you know, it begins, you know, early on in our lives when we're going to see our pediatricians. And I believe it's important that we have the counseling support in schools 
so that we know if you're you know, having, a, str having struggles in your life and there's somebody there that you trust that can intervene. And for those who end up, you know, uh, getting, um, uh, you know, uh, addicted to, to opiates, I think we need to, we, we need to make sure that there is the, a continuum of support. And I don't, and, and again, I, um, my, our goal is to help people. Um, and, um, and so I would, you know, if, if a doctor told me that there needs to be a safe place for people to, you know, to have opiates, I mean, I guess I, my question would be, well, what are we doing to help kind of get them off of opiates? Because that's, that's the goal here. Um, because these are deadly. I um, mean, I got to tell you, um, in, you know, in, in the last couple of years, I, I've been to so many funerals and wakes of, of young people um, your age who have, uh, who have died from this. I, I spoke at a school, a, a woman I went to college with, um, I spoke at a high school in, it, it's in Bethesda, Maryland, and when I walked in to speak, they, they told me that, you know, they wanted me to know in advance that um, in this current school year, already three people had died at this one high school. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's, so I, so I, I think our, our goal on, on opiates is, uh, you know, work, let's work with our medical professionals to try to figure out how we can, how we can best help. Um, and for that, we need the resources. And the other thing we need to do is we need to hold pharmaceutical companies responsible for making all these things so easily available to everybody. Um, and that's a whole nother subject. Yeah. Thank you. So do you think you would support the opening or would you, um, I don't know. I, I don't know because I mean because it, 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 if it's if it's part of a of a medical treatment, then I'm open to it. But I'm but just to, to open a space for people to use opiates that will can, that, you know without helping to try to deal with their addictions. I think I would have a problem with that. All right. All right. Yeah. So while Maya is asking her question, could um, Tali Sieber, Abby Bradley Gilbert, and Elijah Hammerland um, come down to ask your questions? Thank you. Hi, Hi. I'm Maya Mintz Cocoludo. Um, and I was wondering how much uh, money, if anything, uh, should Congress be willing to budget into the border wall? Zero. Yeah, that's what I thought. So. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I bet you, you guys have some good ideas of what you could do with twenty-five billion dollars um, that are better for this country than building a border wall. I've never seen a wall that people haven't been able to climb over or dig under, um, and um, and it's a stupid idea. I mean, just a stupid, stupid idea, but. Um, Now, now, here's the problem right now we're dealing with. So we have these wonderful people we call the dreamers who are here. People who've come here when they were young kids. The only country they know is this country. I mean, they're incredible. I have, I have many dreamers in my congressional district who I meet with regularly. And um, dreamers have been first responders who have saved lives in the aftermath of the hurricane in, in Texas. They've served in our military. I mean, they are, they, you know, they're, they're just, they're great. We should celebrate them, right? Uh, but the president gives a speech and he talks about immigrants and dreamers in the same sentence as he talks about MS-13 gang members. I mean, it's offensive, right? And here's the deal. Um, just so you know this, um, in order to be a dreamer, you had to come forward and register with the federal government. You went to a background check, and you get a status. You get this legal status to be able to remain here, providing you obey the laws of this country. N nobody's a gang member who's a dreamer. Uh, you know, nobody's you know somebody who we wouldn't be proud to have in our schools and our community. Um, they're all wonderful people. We should celebrate them, but the president is holding them hostage. Um, he's holding, and the ransom he wants is not just a wall, uh, but he wants more than a wall. He wants to go after legal immigration in this country. So he's, he, you know, he talks about 
things like, he used these code words like chain migration. And everybody's like, oh, we've got to stop chain migration. Well, chain migration is family reunification. So families can stay together. Why is that such a bad idea? I want families to be able to be together. That, that's, uh, I'm, uh, that's kind of a proud tradition in our country. Why would we not want that? He wants to go after our asylum laws, making it more difficult for people fleeing persecution to find a safe haven here in the United States. I want him to go read the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. You know, I mean, and I want him to read the history of this country. When we have turned our backs on those who have been persecuted, we turned our backs on the Jews during World War II. I think we look back at that with shame. You know, I mean, when we, when we build walls, you know, we look back with shame. Um, you know, he, I mean, I, I go on and on and on uh, about the, 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 the ransom he wants to release the hostages who are the dreamers. But I will tell you, we, the, uh, I'm really upset about this, but, you know, uh, the, uh, but you get, sometimes you gotta, you gotta deal with who you gotta deal with. So the Congress said, the Democrats and Republicans agree with, said to Republicans, we'll make a deal with you. We'll give you a down payment for this stupid, ridiculous, idiotic wall, right, for the dreamers. You know, um, and the president said, okay. And then an hour later, he said, no, I want, all, I want a whole bunch more. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, we, I don't want any wall. The only wall I want to build is around the White House. Um, you know, uh, because I don't want these, I, I'm done. I mean, these people, we want to, we want to keep the xenophobia in the White House, and maybe if we build a wall around the White House, we can get some stuff done. So, but I'm against the wall. So, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so, being in Northampton, it is common that when trying to take a stand against something, it just ends up we're just preaching to the choir. How do you suggest that we take a stand when everyone agrees with you? Well, you know, um, sometimes preaching to the choir is good therapy, all right? Um, because I think, we, I think it's important that we all know that we're not alone. Um, so I think it is important. And I think, um, you know, uh, when you do things here in Northampton, um, it's, it's noticed all around the state. So, I mean, the governor notices, our senators no notice. Um, the other thing, too, is you put pressure on people like me and your state legislators and your local of officials. I mean, if people are, you know, are really passionate about something, that increases the pressure on your elected officials to do more. You know, we could all be good on the issues, but you know, you need more than a vote from me on some of these things. You need me to raise my voice in Washington. You you may need me to join a protest in Washington. Um, so, so, th so that's one thing. The other thing is. You know, um, you, you can influence people in other states. Like I, say, I mean, you all know people in other states. Call them, email them. You can even send them a sample email, what they should send to their representative. Send them a sample letter to the editor on a subject that you feel strongly about. You can influence some of these campaigns coming up. You could do phone banking in Northampton to help support, you know, a candidate, a like-minded candidate in California. I mean. You know, so there's lots of stuff that people can do here. Um, but it is important, even if you feel that we're all in agreement, it's important to, to, to speak up. It's important to raise your voice. And for me, I'm going to tell you the importance, I'm not a mind reader. So, I mean, you know, we may be all like-minded on some issues, but if you don't tell me that, I don't really know for sure. I'm not, you know, I'm, I, could, I could assume you are, but you may not be. So unless you speak up, I'm not quite sure that we're, you know, you know, that we're in sync or, you know, um, and so I think for a, a million reasons, you need to speak up. You need to continue to have passion. You need to continue to, you know, have commitment and dedication and, you know, um, you know, you are in many respects in this part of the state, kind of the inspiration for you know, the resistance movement. Um, and if you start getting quiet, then I think, you know, the ripple effect will be people will say, uh-oh, something's not right here. You know, I mean, you, you need, you, 
And I gotta tell you one other thing too, you know, a lot of the progressive things that have been done in this state and even in this country began here. Um, and, you know, and it's been going on for years. Or there's anti-war movements or, uh, or you know, the, the commitment to dealing with climate change and advocating for a cleaner environment. I mean, I, I, you know, civil rights, human rights, LBGTQ rights. I mean, you know, so much of it began, you know, here and, and grew out of a lot of the activism here. So uh, don't ever think that it's just preaching to the choir because it, it isn't, it's so much more. And, you know, and every once in a while, I mean, Keith Barnacle will send me articles out of the local papers here and, you know, the Hampshire Gazette or the Valley Advocate or whatever, and I'll, you know, and I'll see some of the stuff's going on and, and it'll kind of be like, wow, you know, it's a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of, of a kick in the backside for me to, okay, I got to do some more on this stuff. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's important. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Abby asks her question, could Ray Plant, Jay Ho Chung, and Cody Guild come down? Hi, my name is Abby Radley Gilbert. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming out here today and answering all of our questions. Um, but for my question, it's kind of broad, but what are some of the biggest issues you and others have had to address coming into 2018? Well, you know, I mean, the issues that I, I had wa wanted to address had the election turned out differently, um, you know, we're expanding health care and making advancements uh, in terms of dealing with climate change and um, dealing with issues like hunger and, and poverty in this country and promoting a foreign policy that is based on human rights around the world, but the election didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. So now, we, 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 I think the challenges right now are, you know, protecting the rule of law in this country, um, you know, trying to not get complacent about accepting this president as being, you know, it, 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 well, trying to get complacent with regard to this president and never getting to the point where we get to believe that this is all normal. Um, and, it, and it's, I mean, I worry about freedom of the press. Um, I worry about communities within this country that he has attacked, Muslims. Uh, members of the LBGTQ community, um, you know, I mean, his political opponents. I mean, I'm, I'm worrying about things that never before have I ever worried about with regard to this country. And so kind of the things that I'm, I'm nervous about, you know, are so different from previous presidents, Democrats and Republicans. And and it's really tr troublesome to me. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't know about you. I wake up in the morning and you know, when I turn on the news, I get knots in my stomach because I'm afraid about what I'm going to hear, you know, from moment to moment. And I mean, we're now dealing with this. You probably read about this memo, you know, that the Republicans are releasing, you know, that even Trump's own Republican FBI director doesn't want released because he's afraid it might compromise sources and methods in terms of our intelligence gathering. I mean, this is all so not right and all so not normal that, um, you know, I'm just worried about making sure that the institutions in this country don't get destroyed, um, you know, um, with this guy in the White House. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the stuff, I think that's probably my, what I lose sleep, sleep at night over the most. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ray Plant. Part of the purpose for having this event is so that we can get to know you a little bit better. So I want to make this an open-ended question. What's an issue that you're passionate about that isn't getting enough attention from either side of the political spectrum? Hunger. Um, there's there's four, 42 million people in this country that are hungry. We're the richest country in the history of the world. I'm ashamed of that fact. I mean, um, 
you know, um, I do this. Uh, any, any guys listen to Monty Belmonte at all in the morning? Yeah. So uh, anyway, so I, 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 you know, when I get redistricted out to this area, um, you know, I read his, go on his annual Monty's March, which was first 27 miles, and now it's 43 miles. And, um, you know, um, and I like doing it because it's not just about raising money, and we're raising a lot of money. I mean, we raised $260,000, I think, for the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, which is a lot of meals. But it's also about raising awareness. Because I think there are a lot of people in our communities that don't even know that hunger exists. You know, uh, and um, there's not a city or town in Massachusetts or in the country that is hunger free. And, um, and, and hunger defies stereotypes. You know, there are people who are hungry who are homeless. There are people who are hungry who work, but their wages are so low they, they don't have enough money to put food on the table. And I just think, just, I think we have a moral obligation uh, to deal with this issue. And if people aren't moved by kind of the moral compulsion to end hunger, and all they care about is money and the bottom line, I always tell them that you should want to be with us too because hunger costs us a great deal in this country. So if you, kids who go to school hungry can't learn. Uh, senior citizens who take medication on an empty stomach uh, when it says take it with food uh, because, but they can't afford food and the medication, they end up in emergency rooms. Workers who are hungry are not productive in the workplace. Not, and, and that's not even to get into the issue of the impact on your health. And hunger also manifests itself, you know, in unhealthy eating uh, because sometimes that's all you have access to is junk food. Um, and so it, there is a tremendous cost, but it's just, I just, I kind of think like, you know, I, we just passed a tax cut bill uh, that basically 84% of the, of the benefits go to the top 1% income earners in this country. And it puts our, our country $2.3 trillion into debt that's the deficit by $2.3 trillion. Well, you know what? Rather than give corporations or billionaires a tax cut, you know, I mean, if you wanted to go into debt over something or add to the deficit over something, how about ending hunger in this country? I mean, why, I mean, why isn't that more important than, um, you know, than a tax cut for rich people? You know, and again, give me the $25 billion that Trump wants for the wall, and let's put it toward ending hunger in this country, um, you know, and um, I mean, it, it's doable, and just, but, but look, it's, it doesn't get a lot of attention. Look, the last presidential campaign during the primaries, it was never talked about and, and reporters never asked about it. During the debates between Hillary and, and Trump, nobody ever asked about it. And yet there are 42 million people in this country who are impacted by that. That's a big number, right? And we don't even talk about it. Uh, so, um, so anyway, that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's one of these issues that I can't get out of my, out of my head. I mean, I, and, it, and it's maddening because we can solve it. And these, this is a problem we could solve easily, um, really quickly if we wanted to. Uh, but I tell people hunger is a political condition. We have the resources, we have the food, we don't have the political will. Thank you. <laughs> So while Jay Ho reads his question, um, can J.D. Pruitt, um, Adelaide Green, and Nate Livingston come up? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Jay Ho, a junior here. And like other students, uh, I will be able to vote eventually, or you know, some students already have the right to vote. So with that in mind, what changes will the Democratic Party make to become more appealing to the youth population? Well, that's a question I should be asking you, because um, you know when I think of the you know um, you know when I think of the Democratic Party, I think that we are the party that addresses a lot of the issues that you've all already asked about here today, and maybe we're not doing a very good job of communicating them. Um, but the bottom line is, um, you know, if you believe that we ought to do something about climate change, I mean, we're it, and we had idea we have ideas about what we can do. We have a clean energy platform that we want to pursue. We want to make you know, college more affordable. 
I mean, we're talking about debt-free college. Some of us are talking about free community college. Some of us are even trying to expand that even more. Um, but anybody who wants to get an education ought to get a uh, further education, ought to be able to get additional education, and you ought not, you ought not, not go to college because you can't afford it. Um, we ought to be able to, because, uh, because it's in our interest to g have you get as much education as you can. I mean, on the area of civil rights and human rights and justice and dealing with poverty, I mean, I think we're, we're there. I mean, we're, I mean, and look, we may not, you know, the Democratic Party is kind of a big tent. So you, you get people like me, and then you get people like, you know, you know Joe Manchin in West Virginia. Uh, and so he's a little bit more conservative. But the bottom line is, you know, he represents a state that, quite frankly, wouldn't elect somebody like me. And we represent a state that wouldn't elect someone like him. But we need to find, you know, our common ground and, and get as much done as we possibly can. And sometimes it's not as much as we would all like. I would like a single-payer health care plan today, right? I, I don't have the votes to be able to get it done today. I hope we can get it done soon. You know, I mean, there are lots of things we would like to be able to pursue, but, but I think one of the things I, I'll, I'll challenge you, and I'm not asking, putting the spot here today, but you know, if you have ideas of things that you think we should be saying that we're not saying, or if there are uh, you know, areas that, you know, um, in, in, in media or social media where we should be heard that we're not even you know, involved in, let me know. I mean, I wanna know, I, I wanna, we wanna get this right. Look, if we're gonna change this country, we need to elect people who are gonna think more like us than like the guy in the White House. And we have an opportunity in November to make a, a, a major change in our Congress. If we blow it, I'm not sure when we get another, another chance. And I think the stakes are too high, not just on the issues we've talked about. I'm worried about a nuclear war in North Korea. I mean, and I'd like to think you are too. Um, and so we, we but I, I, we need your input uh, and on how we can do better. But I, 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 I w you know, I think that on, on, on the issues that have been talked about here today, I think we have some pretty good ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adelaide. Um, but this question comes from Lucia Combs Berling. Um, so as we're seeing right now, the question of DACA keeps getting pushed around. Some days it seems like there could be an agreement. The next day the decision gets pushed down the road. Many DACA recipients came to the United States when they were just our age. So when will Congress address this issue and will you accept changes to the legal immigration system and funding for the border wall in exchange for protect protection for DACA students? Yeah. So I'm willing to swallow a lot, right? I mean, I'm, 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 you know, and I'm gonna tell you, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I will, we, we are gonna build a circle of protection around DACA recipients and other immigrants uh, in this community that Donald Trump wants to deport. We're not going to let anybody be deported. We're all gonna, we're gonna show him community action if it gets to that point like he's never seen before. I am a one. Number two, you know, you know, as I said, I mean, the deal is that we, 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 need to, we need to look at dreamers as people, not as bargaining chips. And the votes are there to pass protection for the dreamers right now. But Speaker Ryan and Majority Leader McConnell will not allow them to be brought to the floor of the House and Senate because they know it'll pass. And they are with Trump and using these, holding these dreamers hostage for the border wall. We gave them the border wall, which is a, I hate it, but we gave it to them. And then they moved the goalposts. Now they want changes in legal immigration. If you start changing legal immigration in a way that disrupts families, that doesn't let, you know, a family that came from, you know, um, Kosovo, let's say, to be able to bring their, 20-year-old son with them, or their mother, or their father, well, then we're, we're creating a whole new set of misery for people. 
Um, and I just don't understand why we have to be having this debate. Um, because if we have the votes to pass protection for the dreamers, let's pass it. Then we can fight about all the other stuff later. I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to do, you know, but at some point, I'm not, but I'm not willing to lose my soul over it. Um, and that's, and that's kind of where I'm drawing the line in the sand. I look at it this way, you know, even if we gave them money for the wall, if we could win the Congress back, we could take the money back if we had to and put it towards something else. That's fixable. Um, but, um, but some of the stuff he's talking about doing, I mean, one of the things he's talking about is that he wants to go to basically almost an exclusively, exclusively merit-based um, immigration system. And somebody said to me at a Dunkin' Donuts in Worcester the other day, what's wrong with that? I want smart people to come to the United States. My response was, so do I. But here's the deal. By, Don by his definition of merit-based immigration, I would, not be, I would not be here right now. My grandparents came from Poland and Ireland. My great-grandparents came from Poland and Ireland. They had no education. They would have been disqualified from coming here. My great-grandfather from Poland didn't speak English to the day he died. He would have been disqualified. You know, he wasn't an expert in any field. He would have been disqualified. But he came to Worcester. He worked in the kitchen of Holy Cross College, washing dishes and baking apple pies for his entire life, raised a family, and gave a great deal back to our community, volunteered, was a pillar of the community. On my father's side, the same thing. You know, they weren't educated people who came from Ireland. They came here, opened up a small business, and, and just worked and worked and worked and worked and raised the family. You know, some of them went off to fight in wars, and they gave very generously to their community. They made a difference. They, that's what makes this country great. I mean, to basically write those people off as if they're, we don't want them. And by the way, the president said it all when he said that um, countries in Africa, Haiti, and El Salvador were s-hole countries, if you remember that. We need more people from countries like Norway, he said. Well, you know, if that isn't a racist statement, I don't know what is. And coming from the Commander-in-Chief and the President of the United States, I find that offensive and disgusting. Hi, I'm Nate. So, you grew up in Massachusetts. How did growing up in a place like this affect your future, and how big was the impact? So, yeah, well, I, you know, Massachusetts has been great for me. I love Massachusetts. So, for me, you know, I mean, I, I, I grew up in a family that wasn't particularly politically active, although they, they voted. You know, voting was a big deal in my, in my family. And when I was in middle school, um, there was a presidential election going on. It was in 1972. Um, and Richard Nixon, the Republican, was president. And there was a guy running against him named George McGovern, uh, who I thought had a great last name, um, who was um, campaigning against the war in Vietnam. He, wa he wanted to end the war in Vietnam. He talked about civil rights and human rights and ending poverty and the environment and things that I... I found as a middle schooler so inspiring, and I was like, I, I really like this guy. And I volunteered on his campaign, and I put bumper stickers on people's car, and I passed out literature, and on election night in 1972, I, I remember I was in Worcester, and I was so excited because he won Massachusetts overwhelmingly, um, but then I was depressed that he lost 49 other states. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, and I remember uh, my parents saying to me, you know, um, if you feel strongly about this stuff, you know, then you ought to keep at it and keep your interest up. And, you know, maybe you go to college in Washington, D.C. And I did. Went to American University and worked my way through college working in George McGovern's Senate office. Um, and, um, and I think, um, you know, and then, you know, I worked for a congressman from Massachusetts for a while. I did a lot of human rights work for him, a lot of refugee work. Um, and then decided one day that, you know, I want to run. Um, and I did. And nobody thought I should. And everybody thought I'd lose, including my family. <laughs> but they still supported me anyway. And, but, but here's the deal. In 1996, when I ran, on election night in 1996, when the polls closed at 8 o'clock at night, um, every Boston TV station said I lost at 8.01. And 
And I was like, how could they count the votes so quickly? It's only been a minute. But they said I lost. By 10 o'clock, I was winning. And, I'm j and, I, and I say that because the other thing I've learned in my life is you know what, when, pe when people tell you you can't do this or you're not, you know, you, you don't have enough of experience in this or you're not qualified or you don't fit this or that, you know what, if you want to do something, just do it. And I looked at it this way. <laughs> the worst thing that could happen is that I would have lost that election. I would have been hurt, right? But I met a lot of good, good people and I, got, I learned a lot about this state that I didn't know otherwise, right? And, um, but I thought I would, that, was a, that was a risk worth taking because I'd rather have lost than not tried. Because um, I figured when I was 100 years old in my rocking chair saying, you know, I really wanted to run for Congress, but I was too afraid, or everybody told me not to, or, you know what, losing's not so bad. I mean, not trying and re regretting that you didn't speak up or do something, that is, that is something I don't want to have to deal with, and I don't think you do either. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so while J.D. asks his question, the next three to come up are... Ben Moss Horowitz. Noah Cassis. And Elena Katz. Um, so as high school students, a lot of us are thinking about um, or have already applied to college. And as I watch my sister go through the process I in applying for scholarships, um, I became aware that although there are a lot of opportunities, um, they're usually directed at um, sort of the working class and they're, for everyone, they're really insufficient to help deal with the ridiculously high price of college. So what realistically can the Congress do to help um, all students with college? Oh, it's, a, it's a very good question and something you all should be concerned about. One is, you know, um, for lower income students who are eligible for Pell Grants, we ought to tie Pell Grants to inflation because they haven't kept up. And so why it's helpful in nowhere near covers the cost of, st even, of even state colleges. Two, we ought to find a way that when you uh, apply for loans that you don't accumulate uh, debt. I don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't see why anyone needs to make money off of you going to college, because we're all gonna benefit from it. You're gonna have to pay it back, some of the loans you take, but you know, the interest on some of these loans uh, you know, are ridiculous. So I mean, let's say you took out $5,000, you're gonna probably have to pay close to $8,000 back for a $5,000, I mean, this is, we, we, we should try to, we, we, ought, we ought to have the federal government take over all loans, um, and they ought to be interest-free. Uh, one is, we just had a tax bill, you ought to have been able to deduct more of the cost of college on your taxes. The other thing is, you know, we need to encourage, um, a, 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 you know, businesses uh, to, uh, you know, who want you, because you're, you're the best and the brightest, they want you in their, in their companies to be working out deals with you, and even in, a, you know, um, about once you get out of college, about how they can help pay back some of your tuition uh, as part of your compensation. Um, we have a program like that in, in, on the, in the federal government, but it helps kind of alleviate, you know, the burden of all, all the debt. Um, and I, you know, and, and look, I, 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 we ought to expand you know, the, the, the types of scholarships we give out. Um, I mean, you know, people are, you know, have different talents in different, you know, uh, areas where they excel. I mean, we ought to be encouraging people to excel as much as they can, and there ought to be a reward for that. Um, so I wish I could tell you that, you know, uh, we could pass a bill tomorrow that would make it all free, but it, it, that's just not going to happen. But I do think that we can do some things that can significantly, and I think realistically, if we get a little bit of a better Congress, we can do some things realistically that can significantly alleviate your financial burden. My son is a sophomore at Northeastern right now. And believe me, I know uh, we, we, I, it, is, it is challenging. Um, it is really challenging. And I have a daughter who's 16 who's you know, gonna be following soon. I don't know where she's gonna go, but I'm just, 
saying that um, you know, we, ought, we ought to look at you getting a college education as being not just in your interest, but in all of our interest. If we have a well-educated workforce, you're going to be, we're going to be more competitive in the global economy, so we ought to make sure that you have, we, we provide the incentives and, uh, to be able to help you do it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and my question is, as members of obviously the minority party in both houses of Congress, uh, how can Democrats both here and in Congress really affect public policy when we just don't have the vote? Yeah. So, um, so sometimes we do have the votes, right? Sometimes, you know, and one of the, and, and I think this is one of the frustrating things I've, I've, um, that's happening right now in Congress. So it used to be that you'd bring bills to the floor and you'd fight it out and whoever gets the most votes wins. What's happening now is Speaker Ryan is saying, I'm not going to bring any bill to the floor that doesn't have a majority of the majority supporting it. So, you know, like on the Dreamers, we have every Democrat and we probably have, you know, 50, 60 Republicans, enough to pass it comfortably. But within the Republican conference, that's not a majority of Republicans, so we won't bring it to the floor. So what we have to do um, is, we have to, sometimes it comes down to you have to publicly shame them um, and call them out on things that are particularly egregious and outrageous, which is one thing. Uh, two, in committee, um, to try to help shape bills that are gonna work their way to the floor in a way where you might be able to pick off a few Republicans to get uh, w to, to stand with you so that the bill isn't as bad when it comes to the House floor. Um, but it's hard. I mean, when you're in the majority, you get to set the agenda. So when people say, why aren't you debating this? Or why aren't you debating that? Well, we don't, I, we don't set the agenda. You know, I mean, if, 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 if Nancy Pelosi were the Speaker of the House right now, the DREAM Act would have been taken care of. In fact, when she was Speaker, we actually passed the DREAM Act in the House. So, I mean, it would have been taken care of. Um, but we, we're not in, the, in, the, in control. The Republicans are, and they get to set the agenda. So it is, it is, it is challenging. Uh, but I think I always tell my colleagues who get, who get depressed, you know, don't ever underestimate the power of your voice. Um, and, you know, we are shaping public opinion. Um, and, and it's working. And I think you see a lot of Republicans resigning uh, now, powerful committee chairs are resigning because I think they are convinced they won't, won't be chairs after November. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I wish there were a, that, that we were adhering to regular order and, and, a, and a process that is fitting for our democratic institutions, but we're not. Uh, and I hope if the Democrats take over, I hope that we conduct business in, in the House very differently than the Republicans do. Thanks. Hi. Hey. I'm Ben, again. Um, so this is in the wake of the State of the Union. So at the State of the Union, PolitiFact ranked six of Trump's statements as mostly false or false. And this raises a bigger issue of, of an attack on truth or evidence-based, scientifically-based statements, which are both demoralizing and really frustrating to talk about from, from the place of the classroom that we're in. So many students in my classes felt like the Democratic Party at the State of the Union could have resisted listening to some blatant lies as opposed to letting themselves be bullied. However, this reflects a larger problem with such a partisan provocative figure holding the seat of the president. So my question is, do you think there's a way to resist, to resist lies? How much should this be balanced for the, the system, for tradition and respect for the seat of the president? So do you think Democrats could have protested at the State of the Union? So we talked about that. I mean, we talked about how to conduct ourselves at the State of the Union. And, and you know, part of the, 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 the challenge is, is that um, we have to understand that we're not just trying to appeal to like-minded people or people we already have with us. Um, I mean, politics is about addition. 
Um, and, you know, and there are a lot of people out there who aren't quite sure about Trump, but they're not quite sure about Democrats either. Um, and so, you know, if we got up and booed him, um, you know, every time he told a lie, you know, uh, would that be perceived as being rude and disrespectful uh, to the office of the presidency? I mean, you know, I mean, we know the man is one thing, but then there's the institution is another thing. Um, and you know, should we do a massive walkout? You know, uh, you know, how would that be perceived? And um, should everybody boycott? Well, if we boycott it, what they do is they just fill in people in your seats so nobody knows you're, you know, it wouldn't be a half empty chamber. Um, so, you know, so we, I'm not quite sure. You know, we, we, we talked a lot about how to choreograph this and I think the decision was to be made that, you know, we wouldn't stand up, um, you know, every time he, there was, an, you know, we, we, we wouldn't automatically be standing up, that we'd kind of be muted and just kind of sit there. It may not have been the best approach, but I'm not quite sure whether if we were to, you know, disrupt him, whether that would have been received better. Look, truth matters, and we have to, we, we have to make sure we don't ever tire of correcting the record when he tells a lie. I mean, Kellyanne Conway said that it's not a lie if he doesn't believe it's a lie. Well, you know, facts are facts, you know, and, um, and he's the president of the United States, and he is, and he's not only a compulsive liar, I mean, it's a, he's a pathological liar. I mean, and his behavior is so beyond the pale that um, I, I, I worry too that the bar, bar is being set so low about what we can expect from him. Like, I mean, as long as he wasn't, you know, burping and, you know, drooling, where, you know, oh, it was a great speech, right? I mean, but the bottom line is um, we, 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 we're setting the bar lower and lower and lower because we expect so little from him. And if there's only, you know, what the, how many lives did Politic Facts say? Was it? So it had two as completely false, and it had four as mostly false. Yeah, well, I, and I think they're, they're very generous. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, um, I, 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 my biggest worry right now about his compulsive lying is that people are now saying, well, that's just Donald Trump. <laughs> that's just him. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't ignore it, right? Just Donald Trump. No, because if we ignore it, then it becomes normal. And if it becomes normal, it's not just going to be Donald Trump who tells lies all the time. It's going to be your members of Congress, your senators, your state reps, your governors, your city councilors, your select people. Your, I mean, everybody's going to think that that's the way you're supposed to conduct yourself, and it's not. Um, so, um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether if we'd done something differently, whether how it would have been received. Uh, but, um, but, but we, we need, to, we're also having a discussion about what new kind of tactics can we employ. I mean, I'm telling you, we, we should, I, we, we should take over and do a sit-in, you know, in Statuary Hall or in the Rotunda and just own it and be, have that be a, you know, a, you know, a place where we can constantly vent our, our frustrations with, with, with this, uh, administration. But we need to be, we need to be thinking out of the box on how we, how we deal with him. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming and joining us today. It was a pleasure to hold a town hall meeting dedicated to future voters, activists, and politicians. If you are going to be 18 in the midterms in November, remember to register to vote online or at your local polling station, please. Um, it is so important to have young people engaged in politics, and we hope you continue asking questions and organizing events like this one. If anyone is interested in finding spaces for political and social action, please join us. For more information about Environmental Club, Gender Sexuality Alliance, Mayor's Youth Commission, the Feminist Collective, and Young Democrats, please go to the club bulletin board. Once again, we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Mahar, the students who helped organize this, and of course, Congressman McGovern for providing us all with this awesome opportunity. Thank you, but I just want to say one, one final thing, because first of all, thank you for inviting me here today, and we, we ought to do this more. All right, number one. I'm happy to come back as many times as you want. But I meant what I said. 
earlier, I don't have all the answers. And, you know, if you have some ideas on how we could be more effective in communicating our message, if you have some ideas of issues that are not being talked about, I, I want you to call us. I have an office in Northampton. We also have internship opportunities as well. Um, if you are planning some sort of action, you know, around a particular issue, and it would be helpful for me to be there, please, you know, reach out to us, and I'm happy to try to be a little wind at your back. If I say something that you disagree with in Washington, please, please call, call me, and we'll talk about it. Um, I will meet with one-on-one. -on -one, I will meet with small groups. I'll meet with big groups. But I think this is important. And if there's ever a time for people to actually be engaged in the politics of their community and of their country, it is now. I mean, this is important. So thank you very much for having me here today.